Time is the background of our lives. It regulates our every action. It's personal, ever present. But what is it? And how can it measure? Summer. Fall. Winter. The changing recurring seasons suggest the idea of time. Suggest a way of measuring it. The family. With a young child. Mother who has lived longer. Grandmother with her many years. They are evidence of the flow of time and of an order of events by which time can be measured. This ancient redwood, which was once but a spindly sapling, has seen countless generations and so becomes a yardstick of time. Time is mirrored in the march of history. Time is seen in the succession of man's labors. Time is seen in the movements of the oceans, high tide and low tide. Yes, always when we think of time or try to measure it, we relate it to a series of happenings, to a succession of events, which will give it meaning. Perhaps the simplest, most easily recognized succession of events is day and night. Therefore, it was only natural that lightness and darkness was man's first timepiece. Lines scratched on a stick, one for each day, served as a record. But soon, man noticed that the sun, as it traveled across the sky, threw a moving shadow, the direction of which divided the day into shorter time units, units by which he could better regulate his work by which he could tell how much more daylight remained before nightfall. The length and position of the moving shadow from a stick planted in the ground served the same purpose. It was a crude version of what was later to be known as the sundial. Sun clocks, such as the sundial, took many interesting forms. Among them, this one, popular in ancient Egypt. Here, the ever-changing length of the sun's shadow was measured, and so told time. And as man depended on the sun to measure off the day, he depended on the position of the stars to measure off the night. The stars rose in the east, swung through the heavens, and set in the west, only to reappear the following night. In Egypt, men had come to know certain easily recognized groups of stars. From their stargazing, they painted timetables which told where these stars would be on any night of the entire year. But few Egyptians had the knowledge and the skill to tell time in this difficult way. And to make matters worse, both the sun and the stars were useless when the sky was overcast. Man needed something that would tell time, something that would work at all times, day and night, clear or cloudy. So various mechanical devices were invented to do the job, like this one being used in old Egypt. The slow escape of water from a leaking vessel suggested the water clock. As the vessel slowly emptied, the lowering water level gradually uncovered a scale of marks, which indicated periods of time. In climates where water was scarce, or where it might easily freeze, fine sand or powdered eggshell was used. And this gave birth to the more complicated hourglasses. Hourglasses of many shapes and sizes. For night owls, there was a candle clock, which literally burned away the hours. And sometimes the shadow cast by the candle flame was used. Of course, many things, even a slight draft, would raise havoc with the accuracy of these timepieces. Through the fall of the Roman Empire and the conquests of Charlemagne, there was little improvement in the methods of telling time. 
But out of the Renaissance, which followed the Dark Ages, came two tremendously important discoveries. The first was a mechanism called the escapement. In principle, the escapement was very simple. A falling weight unwound a spool or drum. The drum was connected to a pegged wheel, and biting into this pegged wheel were two catches which allowed the wheel to revolve a little at a time. The catches were connected to an arm, which swung back and forth, ticked off time intervals. As one tooth escaped, the opposite tooth gave a little kick to the catch, and so the swinging arm was kept in motion. It was a crude device and not always reliable, but it was far better than drops of water or running sand or candle flame. And from this came the tower clock, the grandsire of all modern clocks. Following closely came the second great discovery of the Renaissance. Seated in the cathedral at Pisa, the famed scientist Galileo was watching the slow swing of the great lamp. Using his heartbeat to time it, he noticed that the lamp always took the same length of time for a trip back and forth, regardless of how far it swung. As Galileo watched, he saw it as a simple swinging weight, a pendulum. A pendulum follows a simple law. For a given length, it always takes the same time for a trip, regardless of how far it swings. This made-to-order time spacer was applied to a clock mechanism, an escapement in which the pendulum, as it swings, literally bites off equal intervals of time which can be lengthened or shortened by setting the length of the pendulum. This marked the beginning of a long period of popularity for pendulum clocks. Cabinet makers turned their fancy loose to produce every possible variety of shape, material, and decoration. Even the dial was given a series of beauty treatments until it became so ornate that it was almost impossible to read the numbers. But in spite of all the gilt and enamel, clocks were man-sized affairs. They still had to be tall enough to hold a pendulum and to allow for the fall of the weight. Meantime, clockmakers had a field day, unleashed a flood of new and often fantastic escapements, let loose a host of unique variations of clock mechanisms. Along with these came two developments which led to smaller and better clocks. First, a coiled spring replaced the weight as driving power. It could be wound up as easily as a weight, and it took much less room. Next, the pendulum was replaced by a combination of balance wheel and hair spring. As the hair spring winds and unwinds, and the balance wheel turns back and forth, the teeth of the escapement wheel are released, and so measure off even time units. With a new, more compact mechanism, the clock graduated from the floor to the table. And finally, the table clock shrunk to pocket size, and thus the watch was born. Odd shapes, curious mechanism, and elaborate decoration were the fashion. This royal gift a golden egg decorated with intricate design opens to reveal a maze of dials. Often one hand had to do the work of two. Some were heavy and plump. Some thin, but as large as a saucer. Alarm or striking watches were great favorites. Today, the modern watch a far cry from its pudgy ancestors has come into being. Dependable and accurate, the modern watch is a monument to human ingenuity. Ingenuity in the application of ever better manufacturing methods. And ingenuity in the discovery and use of revolutionary new materials. Materials like this metal, for instance. It is a new alloy and has been named Elgiloy. 
perfected after many years of intense research and experimentation, Elgiloy is composed of eight basic elements. Iron, steel cannot be made without it. Carbon, another element needed to make steel. It hardens the steel. Molybdenum, when blended with iron and carbon, it gives strength to steel. Manganese, it removes unwanted elements and so purifies. Chromium, it helps to prevent corrosion. Nickel, also prevents corrosion and helps to demagnetize the blend. Beryllium, it reduces fatigue, increases durability, makes for longer life. Cobalt, an element which helps to better blend all the other elements. This new and tough alloy then is the material from which Elgin's DuraPower mainspring is made. A new kind of mainspring, it represents the greatest single development in watchmaking during the last two centuries. This new DuraPower mainspring, made from Elgiloy, will never rust, will never break, will never grow weak or limp. Even the strongest acid has no effect on the new spring. This is a DuraPower mainspring. This is a conventional steel mainspring. In they go. The ordinary spring completely disappears. The DuraPower mainspring remains unchanged. Truly, because of Elgiloy, the revolutionary new alloy, the modern watch today has a heart that never breaks, a heart that gives the modern watch long life and amazing accuracy. But at what speed shall these watches run? How do we know when they tell the right time? Against what standard shall our watches be checked? To answer this, we must return to nature, the master clock to the sun on its daily journey across the sky and to the regular movements of the stars through the night. At dawn and early autumn, the Egyptians noticed a group of stars just above the horizon of the eastern sky. At dawn one week later, they noticed that this same group of stars was slightly higher. A month later, these stars were still further ahead of the sun. Finally, after approximately 365 days, because of this continuous advance, they found the same group of stars again in the same position as during their first observation. These things were observed, but they were not understood until hundreds of years later when the astronomer Copernicus offered a simple and logical explanation. He showed that the Earth travels around the Sun once every year. Meanwhile, it spins on its own axis, like a top. It is this spinning into and out of the Sun's rays that creates day and night. And as part of the Earth moves into darkness, the people on that side of the Earth see group after group of stars come into view. This nightly panorama of the firmament enables us to tell time by the stars. For the stars, as well as the sun, measure off time. But sun time and star time differ. Suppose directly overhead at night is a star billions of miles away. At another point on the Earth, to another observer, the Sun is directly overhead. The Earth turns exactly one revolution, and meanwhile it moves a short distance in its trip around the Sun. It is the next night. The star is again directly overhead, 
and a star day or sidereal day has elapsed. At the other point on the Earth, however, the observer does not find the sun any longer directly overhead. It takes the Earth a little longer, three minutes and 56 seconds to catch up. This is a solar day, the day of lightness and darkness by which we live. But since it varies slightly from day to day, our timepieces are checked for accuracy by the stars. At Elgin, Illinois, home of fine American-made watches, the accuracy of tens of thousands of watches is continuously checked. The telescope that relates time to the stars is built so that it can swing only in one direction, north and south, along the imaginary line called the celestial meridian, which is directly overhead in the sky. In the lens system of this telescope is a web of vertical lines. These are reference lines, and one of them is movable. When the star to be observed, called a clock star, appears in vision, the vertical line is moved under the control of a finely adjusted micrometer wheel. The line cuts the star exactly in half and follows the star from east to west. As the moving thread crosses the exact center of the field, an electrical circuit is broken, and the star's movement is automatically recorded on the tape of a delicate electrical instrument. The regular beats of the clock, which tell sidereal time, as perfect a timekeeping instrument as man's ingenuity has been able to devise, are recorded on the same tape. Thus, the record gives the rate of travel of the star according to the sidereal time clock. This is compared with the correct entry in an elaborate set of star tables, which gives for every clock star the exact time it must appear on any day of the year. By this unceasing check with nature, the scrupulous accuracy of the sidereal time clock and its companion, the mean solar time clock, is assured to the hundredths of a second. And from these faithful standards, timepieces all over the world are set and checked and double-checked. We have seen how human progress brought with it a stream of inventions carrying the telling of time from the sundial of the ancients down to ever better mechanical devices. At the same time, man's searching eyes have probed ever deeper into the heavens, and his knowledge of the timetable of the universe has steadily increased. Today, beating out with faithful regularity the unceasing motions of the stars is the modern watch. Today, timepieces are a far cry from their earlier ancestors. They are thinner, neater, less expensive, and infinitely more accurate. Human ingenuity and the unchanging laws of nature have given us these timepieces to which all of our life is geared. Time is universal. Time guides the little things of everyday life. Time is the aid of the doctor and the scientist. Time guides the wheels of industry. Time guides the complicated schedules of our transportation system. become the servant of man.